He's a PhD in immunology. And I met, I met um, Joram about, uh, was it a year ago or two years ago? Two years ago. Yeah, and at Caltech, where we had a, there was a, a workshop on emergency medicine. And, and I was very excited about uh, looking at the stuff Joram was doing. Because Joram looks at, at organ systems and how organ systems respond to inflammation. And that might sound like a little bit like off the beaten path for, for us in sort of the living machines community or people who care about the brain or about uh, computation. Um, but I think, however, there are much closer links than you might think. Like they're, they're twofold. This is why I really like Joram's work. And I think it has a lot to offer about something challenging our, our way of thinking. And one, we talk about network systems, and, and also when you talk about the brain, this whole idea of, of, of having network analysis and looking at the complex network structures of brain and brains to build information or technologies and, and methods to analyze them. Actually, these methods are very compatible with the network nature of organs in general. So maybe there's a much more general principle behind this system that Joram is, is after when he looks at how organs respond to, to inflammation. And the second thing that also relates very much to, to what, what uh, Joshua was talking about just earlier. The self is a big issue for us, right? Because we all, like well, Tony, Tony is, is hanging his whole career now, his whole future prospects on developing a science of self. And that's not because he has such an inflated self himself. It's just <laughs> scientific interest. So, but, but that, we were beating about this bush of self in this domain of neuroscience for a long time. And in some sense, if you think about organ systems, it's really the foundation of self, right? So I think these are two reasons why, why I really was very excited about George's work and I thought we have to bring him here. And fortunately, it then turned out to be the case that he was in the area anyway to get a Ruben. So I thought, okay, we should make, we should take advantage of that and get Joram here. So it's wonderful that you're here. I'm really looking forward to your talk. And um, don't forget to post your questions afterwards. Thanks, Joram. Yeah, so hopefully the, 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 the talk will actually make even closer links than what um, Paul was initially alluding to. Um, as he said, I do have somewhat of a different view about how inflammation fits in to a uh, higher order uh, phenomena, so hopefully I can get that across. Um, first, just to uh, add some uh, sort of acknowledgments, uh, and the first one is that I'm really not a neuroscientist. So, um, uh, in a sense, I'm a kind of a fish out of water, but the reality of it is, uh, hopefully like the rest of you here, I'm, I'm really interested in learning, uh, getting some new perspectives uh, from people who are neuroscientists. To, to sort of paraphrase the, 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 the well-trod sort of saying, um, I, I, I'm sort of like a model, like all models, I'm probably mostly wrong, but, but hopefully you're gonna find me useful. Um, <coughs> so, uh, in terms of more real disclosures, I'm a, Co-founder and, and, a, and a sort of stakeholder in a company called Immunetrics that uh, we founded about uh, 15 years ago in Pittsburgh as a spin-off of some of these mathematical models of inflammation that I allude, allude to, um, and I've also had funding uh, from uh, uh, both the NIH and the Department of Defense for the current work uh, and other other agencies before. And I also like to acknowledge uh, a bunch of people uh, that I'm going to be alluding to in my talk, and this is kind of the cast in, in sort of order of appearance. Um, this is Tim Billier, he's my chair of the Department of Surgery. Uh, actually, I've known him since I was a graduate student and he recruited me to Pittsburgh in uh, 1999 uh, and really facilitated a lot of work that I did, which at the time was sort of in the fringe and, uh, and I really can, can't thank him enough for that and he continues his support. Um, Ruben is in the back, some of you have met him and uh, those of you that did, um, there's like free therapy sessions. Uh, um, this is uh, uh, Gary Ahn. Uh, Gary is a trauma surgeon at the University of Chicago, but actually a pioneer of using agent-based models for uh, modeling inflammation. And now he's really into uh, deep reinforcement learning uh, as a way of uh, interpreting the outcomes of, of ABMs and also controlling, uh, so doing dynamic uh, model control on uh, agent-based models using uh, ERL. And you might want to look up his papers if you're interested in some of that cross, cross interaction. Um, so this is John Doyle, some of you might know him. Uh, he's uh, really a world expert in complex systems at Caltech. Uh, uh, I, I met John in 2004 and really helped to shape a lot of my thinking um, uh, about, about inflammation, but about complex systems.
Um, this is Yannis Androulakis. He's a, uh, uh, he's a scientist at Rutgers University. Um, he uh, has a background in engineering and uh, actually had made some of the very first sort of coarse grain models of inflammation that link to neural, neural uh, control and, and kind of neural, neurophysiologic type outcomes. And we did some work together that I'll, I'll point to. Uh, this is uh, this happy looking guy is Ted Dick. He's he's uh, a Case Western. He is a physiologist, and he looks at especially breathing pattern variability, uh, and also makes models uh, uh, of that. And and then we we've, we've got some work that we're doing together that is very relevant uh, that I'll that I'll talk about. Breathing later. or breathing? Uh, breathing. breathing. So. Uh, sort of like, uh, as you know, many organ, uh, many physiologic <coughs> waveforms for organs like heart rate uh, are, have this variable pattern. There's an entire uh, complex systems approach, sort of uh, time series transformation of the data that people have been doing for a while. And it, it, it has actually reached a point where it has diagnostic value. It's sort of baked into uh, various bedside monitors. Uh, but it, it also suffers from this kind of quasi mysticism about uh, numerical transformations of waveform data, and it gave a bit of a strange cast to this whole uh, complex systems field, or complexity science, as people call it. Uh, or as John Doyle says, anything with the word science in it is in the science. Um, so this is Kevin Tracy. Uh, he is uh, a, a neurosurgeon, uh, but ac uh, actually a real pioneer of the field of neural control of inflammation. He's somebody that I've known for about 20 years as well. And again, I'll mention some of his important work. Um, and then there's this guy. Uh, at the end there, that's Paul, and I'll talk about some of the interactions that we did uh, that, 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 that he alluded to uh, also in the talk. Okay, so um, we live in, in a world, uh, uh, at least in the Western world, and probably now the Eastern world too, uh, where we have a lot of different diseases that affect patients. And for a long time, these were just independent entities, there's many more of them. But now we know they're really linked by this process of inflammation. So um, now inflammation has many, many different connotations, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about what I think inflammation is. But suffice it to say that it seems to be a sort of the, a binding mechanism across all these diseases and also cancer and many others. And I would make, I would go so far out on the limbs to say that every disease, in one way or another, uh, is impacted by or impacts on or both uh, the inflammatory response. Importantly. Very, uh, very necessary uh, and beneficial processes are also dependent on inflammation. So, you know, every time you go and do a workout, uh, you will get an inflammatory response. If you do a really serious workout, you'll have a really strong inflammatory response. Um, some of you will know that as the feeling of soreness in your muscles, but it's also actually systemic inflammation with mediators that are not really that different from the ones you would see um, and someone having an infection or a traumatic injury. And then we now know that um, uh, rehabilitation, so for example, taking somebody who is injured and then having them moving their muscles in a particular way also impinges on the inflammatory response and, and helps to drive, if anything, an anti-inflammatory response or a pro-healing response. And so the point is, this is all complicated, right? Because if you actually were, when I got into this, which was right around the year 2000, um, the feeling was that my disease is very different from your disease. So I study this disease, and it's very important, it's very special, and it has these mediators. And then somebody would say, no, no, my disease is very important, it's very special, and they would list the exact same mediators. Um, but then when you compare time courses, let's say if you look at the mediators, and we'll discuss what those mediators are in a second, um, they really did look different. I mean, uh, the same mediator that was implicated in disease A would show up early, and in disease B would show up much later. In disease A or C, it was very high, in disease D, it was low, but it was still implicated in the disease. So this was a conundrum because you kept on seeing the same parts, but they were somehow showing up at different times or in, in different order. And, and so there was this big confusion. And one of the things that I got into doing, and what is really the, the motivating <coughs> factor for what I do now, is to try to come up with a kind of unifying theory of inflammation. And I'm hopefully going to convince you that we're on the, on the right track for so um, we came up, in, in, so Gary Ahn and I uh, came up with this concept of translational systems biology in 2008, and then we, um, we, we published this book about it in 2014. 
um, because we had another problem at around the same time that we got started. So he got started right in 1999, 2000. I got started around 2000. We met each other by total coincidence at a meeting in 2002, and we decided to, to kind of join forces and work together. Um, and the other problem that we had was, as much as there was all kinds of, um, uh, let's call it divergent opinions about um, how inflammation interacted with, to come up with all, to, to end up in all these different diseases, the systems biology field was also undergoing, uh, or, or was just coming up, and was, was well, there were already many sort of turf battles and, and uh, battles over the, the definition. And you know, if you get to define something, you kind of get to own it. Um, the, the initial battles were, and still are, I think, about um, data-driven modeling versus mechanistic modeling. That continues to be an issue. Um, but even within the sort of uh, accepted norms of, say, me mechanistic modeling or, or sort of mechanistic approaches to, 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 to modeling and understanding abstract and complex systems, um, there, were, there were, in my mind, two key differences. So if we can use something so, we can call something so young classical. So classical systems biology is really about basic insights. Uh, so, so people were really studying, you know, what are the, what are the core pathways or molecules uh, that make something happen? And they typically tended, wanted to sort of end at the cell membrane. Right? So it was everything in the cell is the only thing that mattered. Um, and uh, so the problem with that is, well, how do you apply that clinically? Because on the end, at, at some level, this kind of systems biology is just as reductionist as doing something reductionist because it's just ending at the cell. And although we are made up of cells, we are much more than just take everything that's happening in one cell and multiply it by a trillion and you get you. Um, so, um, so we thought that the, we came at it from the other side. Because Gary's a clinician. I'm not a clinician, but I, uh, I work in a, in, a, in a clinical department and I really wanted to actually solve problems. So I said translational insights are really the primary goal. But then, so then the problem becomes how do you incorporate all the mechanisms? So each side had its own set of problems. Um, so again, coming back, so if, if you start from this basic uh, insights being necessary, then what is systems biology good for? Well, it's good for, uh, for getting these insights and you're gonna only think about cellular and molecular interactions, signal transduction pathways, and so forth. Whereas we wanted from the beginning to have a, a kind of, this is sort of an engineering mindset, where we wanted there to be a, a practical utility of what we did, right? And what we, what we wanted to do, and, and what, what the first application was, was at the level of simulating uh, clinical trials. Basically having a, a disease model at some abstraction, but that was good enough to create virtual populations of patients, and that we would then use that to test uh, the efficacy of drugs in silico. Um, just to give people a context, um, I'm, this concept of in silico clinical trials, which is the, big chunk of the focus of the meeting that I'm going, that Ruben and I are going to in Saragossa right after this for a few days. It's, I think it's called the Virtual Physiologic Human Meeting. Um, it's now embedded in the US FDA's sort of funding charter. Uh, today, there's a meeting phase, September 4th, right? So th there's a meeting going on in Brussels, the EU Parliament, run by uh, a good friend of mine, Adriano Penny, who runs the Avicenna Alliance, which is all focused on in silico trial. So I think we are the ones that came up with that word in 2004 uh, in, our, in a, our first paper on uh, simulating uh, clinical trials in sepsis. Um, now at the other end, you can take the same basic models, say mechanistic models, calibrate them with data for individuals, and you can create essentially a virtual patient. Um, we did that for the first time in 2008. Um, uh, and uh, you can then potentially uh, come up with Diagnostics. You can say, well, I, I take some data about this patient, um, and then I run, I use the data to lock the simulation down, and I and I can and I, and I can now predict where this patient is headed. So it's a diagnostic. Um, and then at the other end, uh, yet of this space, you can take the same mathematical <coughs> model with the same utility, let's say, also at predicting uh, the actions of drugs that you already know, and you could, of course, uh, use various. Um, uh, manipulations to come up with what the ideal drug should do, and then that effectively gives you properties for a drug, in which case it can be used as a, as a, as a central front end for rational drug design or war design. Um, now, again, coming back to the classical view, if everything's about basic insights, then you have to keep things incredibly consistent and constant. You have to have very tight condition. You're going to stick to, 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 to really well-defined experimental systems. Usually at that time, it was yeast. Um, bacteria, uh, you might engineer bacteria, people did that, still do, 
Um, everything is about the laboratory validation. To us, uh, we really wanted the proof to be in the pudding, and so we really needed those simulations to be validated clinically, uh, which is very messy because the, there's a lot of factors that go into uh, the actual clinical uh, uh, application of, of modeling. Um, because there's a, there's a lot of everything from, from regulatory and ethical hurdles to just the fact that the data are much more variable. And the data collection process is much more messy. Um, and then finally, for the people that were coming at things from the sort of data driven side, omics was starting to come up at that time. So it was initially transcript omics, but uh, all the other omics that we all kind of know about. Um, and, and people were, were looking at how to associate various patterns with some sort of an outcome or some sort of a, a phenotype. Um, whereas we wanted to figure out ways in which we could discern mechanism from these omics, right? Like why is this outcome associated with any given pattern? Um, and initially, of course, you know, we were the bad boys on the block and we were taking the translational systems biology approach. With a little bit of time, we realized that really we all need to get along and, um, and find ways to, to link these two. Likewise, we were coming into it with the mindset that data-driven models had largely failed. Uh, with time, we began to do data-driven modeling and uh, interact with people to do data-driven modeling and, and came up, tried to come up with ways in which we could, again, link these two processes together. So, um, so it's all about love and coexistence. Um, now, the, uh, around 2004, to help facilitate this, we uh, started a center in Pittsburgh at our McGowan Institute for Regenerative Medicine, called it creatively the Center for Inflammation and Regenerative Modeling. I had a couple other acronyms. We ended up with this one. Um, the interesting thing about it is it's, it's a virtual center, but we, we interact as a nucleating point, for, as an interdisciplinary nucleating point. Uh, and, and that has been interesting in and of itself, just learning uh, how to talk to people that are in different fields. Um, but the core is that, every, that people are focused on translational applications of various computational modeling techniques. Um, we've done a lot of different things. We started with these kind of qualitative and reduced models of sepsis and wound healing. We moved into more quantitatively predictive models of sepsis and trauma. We did these in silico trials. Um, we, um, we made uh, patient-specific models of trauma. Some of the people in the, in the, in the group were doing these physiologic waveform analyses that I, uh, I alluded to. And then more recently, we've, although I, I kind of stayed away from this, but we're now uh, uh, sort of, it's unavoidable to be in the whole uh, genome field. So we've got some of the first publications <coughs> large-scale uh, single nucleotide polymorphism arrays, and we're uh, fortunate that uh, at our institution, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, is putting a huge effort into whole genome sequencing at a large scale. So uh, we, we will be doing large-scale whole genome sequencing and are becoming familiar with how to, how to deal with these data and integrate them in some fashion into some of these models. Um, we've done a bunch of transcriptomics and metabolomics, and then again, uh, now we have a new center for the uh, microbiome in, at Pitt. And uh, we've gotten some of our first data on that as well because a whole topic for a different talk about how the microbiome might interact with an integrating uh, uh, influence in, in, in inflammation. All right, so just, just some snapshots uh, uh, of just to give people a sense. We, we, they're not actually in, se in time sequence because we started later on data-driven models, but we were interested in, uh, as it was Paul alluded to, uh, network analyses and other types of data-driven models. Um, I think the big differentiating factor was we were very focused on dynamics, and so we were doing dynamic network analyses. We developed some algorithms for that. We, we repurposed some algorithms other people had put together, and, um, and that was useful because you could try to go from just generalized patterns to, to sort of a network view of that, to some of those networks led us to potentially novel biomarkers for diseases like in trauma, um, and then, but our ultimate goal really is to to get some kind of at least quasi-mechanistic insight from these dynamic network analyses that we can then bring back into the mechanistic model. Uh, at the mechanistic modeling side, again, as I mentioned before, we sort of really, I think, pioneered this, uh, this concept of in silico clinical trials. This is our 2004 paper in uh, critical care medicine, simulating the, uh, the, 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 the failed uh, clinical trials of, uh, directed against key uh, inflammatory mediators back in the late 80s and early 90s, showing how, um, had they taken their actual assumptions that they, that in data that they had at that time, 
had they put them into fairly simple differential equation models, and had they generated virtual populations from those models, they would never have run the trials the way they did because they were doomed to fail. And in fact, we reproduced a lot of the features of the actual trial and subgroup analyses of those trials using these relatively simple models. Uh, all the way to this, uh, these papers, this one in 2015 in Science Translational Medicine, we um, had now multi-compartment differential equation models that could be virtual patients calibrated against data, depending on what we, on which part of the analysis, between 100 and 150 trauma patients uh, to create these sort of virtual trauma patients. And then uh, at the other end of the scale, if you will, uh, using agent-based models to create tissue realistic simulations of inflammation, so all the way from microscopic scale, say, that can simulate histology in tissues, to the macro scale, for example, uh, skin lesions, uh, ulcers, that sort of thing. Again, uh, when possible, calibrated or validated against uh, real data, so we had a complete program of, of, of data gathering that we could run from my, my lab, which is typically, just as an aside, where the problem often happens in, uh, in the computational modeling field, which is the people doing the models typically don't have the ability to actually generate the data prospectively. They have to then collaborate with, with other groups to do that. So to close that loop uh, is often uh, very difficult, especially if people are in different institutions. The time that it takes, we have the ability to, to do that on a fairly uh, fast time scale. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned, uh, this idea of trying to link things, link the data-driven models to the mechanistic models, a couple of examples uh, of that. Uh, this, this, this model here about uh, looking at uh, very, uh, a type of uh, sepsis, experimental sepsis in swine, and then this one in traumatic brain injury, which was really our first paper where we went from a data set to uh, a set of uh, uh, dynamic uh, networks that were inferred from the data to extracting the core features of those networks <coughs> and creating differential equation-based models and then, and then testing those models against data. Um, and, and we have hopefully a couple more studies uh, in the pipeline that are, that are going in this direction. Um, and I think this, just as an aside, this probably is the only rational way that we can truly incorporate modeling into, into especially mechanistic modeling, into, uh, in a scalable way into the biomedical enterprise because uh, you know, if you are making mathematical models and you're only picking and choosing the variables that you want to include, which is what we did really for a long time because you know we're smart and we're in the field, um, people will always challenge you. But if you can show that you did a reasonable effort at uh, gathering a fairly uh, uh, broad array, high content array of data, and then you have a, a, a data, a validated data-driven tool that can get you to a to a snapshot or a, a, an initial abstraction. Uh, and then you can show, okay, these are, the, these are the reasons that I'm taking these variables and putting them into a mechanistic model. I think people, that just has more face validity. Again, uh, it's hard to do only because you, you need the whole enterprise really to be able to, to do that. Um, so, so that's good. I mean, so that, that, that's a recap of the last 15 years of my life. But, the, but the, in doing that, we, we realized we were, we were missing something. And, um, and this is what we were missing. So, at some point, no matter what you do, it's like when all else fails, you use your brain. So, um, you know, at some point or another, we, you have to come back to what is the role of the brain. I'll, I'll, I'll try to lay out the, the path by which we kind of came to this. Um, so first, I, I, as a contemporary development, uh, Kevin Tracy had been publishing his work on what he called the inflammatory reflex. And again, some of you may be familiar with this, but there's, there is now a reasonably well-established mechanism for in some aspects of control of inflammation. Kevin would say all of it, but I think that there may be other mechanisms as well. But it's via vagus um, impacting uh, on inflammatory cells and distal tissues. And um, the, the, the important thing to think about is, at this point, is that every tissue in your body is sort of organized for this. So take the liver or the lung, or just really think of any tissue in your body. How is it, how is it constructed? It, it's basically a set of structural or functional cells, or a combination of them, which we call parenchymal cells. And they're the ones that do the basic job of being that tissue. So, you know, if you're a liver, you have hepatocytes, they're basically doing the job of detoxification and, uh, uh, and various other um, metabolic functions that the liver does. Interspersed among them will be 
resident inflammatory cells. They're macrophage type cells, but they're called different things just for historical reasons in different cells and different tissues. So in, in the liver, they're called Cooper cells. Uh, they're called different things in different tissues. And then often touching onto those inflammatory cells are nerve termini. So the, 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 the system is set up to be, to be integrated in this fashion. And, and as I'll talk about in a second, inflammation is a sort of most fractal phenomenon. It happens at every scale you could imagine. Um, and uh, yeah, you could take individual cells, like I could take this macrophage and put it in culture, absent all this other stuff, and I could give it stimuli and I could get it to do inflammatory things. But that isn't really the way it works. And yet, many of the phenomena that I'll observe about that cell and culture on its own, I will also observe about this organ on its own. And, and, and with all of that, this inflammation can spill outwards and show up in the systemic circulation or other biofluids like the cerebrospinal fluid or urine. Um, and if I look at that level, it will also look like what happens in the cells and culture. So there's a lot more going on. At some level, there's a, there's a program that, that, that uh, reproduces the behavior at different scales. Um, and you can take parts of it apart and get that behavior for those parts, but yet there must be additional dimensions of, of control that come from this, this, this structure. Um, now, another key part, and I'll talk about these mediators in a little bit, um, are important <coughs> early pro-inflammatory cytokines. Uh, these are inflammatory mediators, protein inflammatory mediators, like tumor necrosis factor, interleukin-1. Um, a key, a key feature of which is uh, positive feedback. So these, these, these uh, mediators will beget more of themselves. And that's very important because it's a way in which inflammation rapidly can ramp up and do things. And, and Kevin's group has elegantly dissected this process up and down, um, you know, doing bigotomies, uh, uh, doing various interruptions to some of the molecular pathways, um, showing that you know, the acetylcholine pathway is really important. Um, and, uh, and, and so, I think this acts as a, as a very minimum, if it's not the entire story, it's at least a, it's at least a template, a prototype of how to get at what the entire story actually is. Um, so, so now let's think about kind of a, just a starting set of concepts. Uh, the, the, up until now, it's more of a background to get you to kind of where, or, or how these concepts make sense, or why I formulated them. Um, so hopefully I'm not, uh, this is not a controversial statement that, that it, key function of the brain is to inform itself of changes home in homeostasis. So to find out what is going on on a microsecond to microsecond basis. Okay, well, interestingly, inflammation also is a, a key mechanism by which the body, and then my question is the brain maybe, informs itself of changes in homeostasis. So um, you get an infection, or you get a traumatic physical injury, or you have a slow degenerative process in some of your cells, and they, and I'll talk in a second about a, an ordered cascade of mediators that get released that stimulate a response which is aimed at repairing that problem. So either getting rid of the infection, <coughs> repairing the tissue that's hurt, uh, attempting to somehow restore the physiologic function that's, that's not working, right? And so then you come back to homeostasis. Um, and that's a well-known well set of features about inflammation, right? And now we know also that inflammation is regulated by the brain. So maybe we can think of this just for the sake of my talk, you know, uh, that there is this sort of neuroinflammatory cell. Um, and, and what would that be like, and what does that do? Um, importantly, there are many evolutionary conserved mechanisms for inflammation in general, so you can go down to systems that don't have neuro neural systems, and you can see that inflammation happens and that it's regulated. And so clearly there's mechanisms, as I said, this sort of fractal sense of it, which is that, that inflammation can happen very low, uh, you know, perhaps the lowest of, of organs, perhaps single cell organs. Um, and so you don't need all the other parts. And so the system has a way of being regulated locally at the single cell level, even, at the, at, the, at the tissue level. And then once you add these other control mechanisms, it seems as if they're facilitating that or making it more efficient or maybe coordinating the process to allow things to happen in multiple places at the same time. Or maybe to help drive once there's a brain there, to help drive some changes in the brain that are relevant for other things. Um, it's, it, it's been well known that inflammation is necessary for healing of injuries, and more recently, in the last uh, eight, eight or 10 years or so, people like uh, uh, Charlie Serhan at, at Harvard have shown that um, inflammation is also necessary 
for regeneration. Regeneration is a different thing from, from, he from healing. Healing is, you know, you kind of heal uh, a, a broken surface of your skin or something like that or an injury inside. Regeneration is truly like, you know, I chop off a limb and it can grow back, which some organisms can do. And inflama inflammatory cues seem to be necessary for that. Um, and, and, but then the problem becomes that this kind of crosstalk is dysregulated in many diseases. Um, to the point that guys like Kevin Tracy started an entire field of bioelectronic medicine, where people are using direct brain stimulation to modify heretofore intractable inflammatory diseases, and he's attacking things like sepsis uh, and other, and other and sort of chronic uh, inflammatory diseases. Um, so, so we, we know this to be true, and so then there's this puzzle, right? At the, at the, at the heart of it, Inflammation can be both good and bad. Very dependent on the context, on the timing, uh, individual circumstances, and so forth. And so the, but, but we can make some, set, some, some general statements, which is that inflammation is generally, quote, good when it stays local. That's not always true, right? You can have a local sort of abscess that keeps going for a while, but I, 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 I think that it's, it's more the, it is still good in the sense that the abscess is local and it's not spreading an infection throughout your body. Um, so infection or, or, or inflammation is good when it's staying where it needs to be, where the problem actually is. But it's bad when, by the time it spills over into the systemic circulation. And bad again, good and bad are incredibly uh, subjective terms here because the process of spilling out into the systemic circulation is itself part of a, of a feedback cascade that needs to be invoked in order to be able to solve the problem. So, so it's just another layer where information is being, is being obtained. Um, and then the real question that comes up is, and it didn't seem like anybody was addressing this directly, but we're trying to address it, which is that could this be the point, this, uh, sorry, uh, go back. Yeah, so uh, could this be, uh, could this be the, 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 the real important role for neuroinflammatory crosstalk, right? And then, as I said before, this is manifest in dynamic pattern, and then our goal in this translational system biology concept is to unify these disparate concepts and then importantly to apply them clinically, not just to have great uh, coffee table conversations about how it all works, but to, to see if we can make it actionable. And I should say that if one of the underlying ideas for this was that if, if we can make it actionable at the clinical level and it really works, there's a high chance that whatever we discover there will also be important at the basic science level. And we're, we've got a paper that hopefully we'll be submitting very soon that I think we'll get at that. So starting from thinking about it at the clinical relevance might get you to the basic relevance, but starting from the basic relevance may or may not get you to the clinical relevance. I think that's at the heart of the so-called translation of the Um Okay, so some things I learned from, from John Doyle over the years um, that became part of my vocabulary, but I thought it was important to point out kind of where I was influenced. Um, so uh, inflammation is really complex and redundant and interconnected, as I said, I alluded to before. Part of it is the organization, so you have aspects of inflammation from the molecular to the population, right? So uh, it's uh, prototypically a complex system. You can't determine the whole from the sum of the parts. People have been trying to determine this uh, from the sum of the parts for a very long time. You know, they went from standard reductionist experiments to large-scale omics studies. Let's throw everything on the floor here and see if we can put it back together again. Hasn't really worked out. Um, it changes with time and context, so inflammation is the prototypical dynamical system, um, especially in the diseases we, we study in my group, like sepsis and trauma, it moves very, very fast. And it's also very dependent on initial conditions. So if once things are kind of set in motion, the trajectory of the patient seems to be pretty much locked in stone and requires fairly heroic attempts to, to try to restore the health of the, of the individual. Um, and this is a function of positive and negative feedback loops. Um, inflammation is really cool because it's highly adaptable and resistant to many perturbations, but it's also a real pain uh, from a therapeutic point of view because it's highly adaptable and resistant to many perturbations. So when you come in with a drug that's attempting to hit at one point of this web, the web just sort of reconfigures around it and uh, inhibits your, you know, blocks you from being able to come up with a solution to the, to the problem. Um, and then this concept of robustness versus fragility that John, you know, is pretty well known for. So the robustness is in part due to the, the, the way that inflammation is compartmentalized, again, across many dimensions, from the gene all the way to the population. 
Um, the fragility is that there's control points and the control points can fail, right? And that, that brings us back to what is, what are the control points and is the brain an important uh, place to look for them? So, so yeah, so highly susceptible to degradation of central control uh, under certain conditions can be positive. So I'm not going to give a brief overview of inflammation because I'm fairly certain nobody in this room uh, is actually a professional inflammation biologist. So it's actually useful to go over some, some basic terms just so that when I say things, it's not um, completely mystifying and I don't have to take a uh, million questions from people to, to explain what, what each word means. So I think I will just take your time already with some slides. So I want to first thank Jay Fan at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, for about a decade, I was running a course called the Systems Approach to Inflammation in Pittsburgh. Jay was a great lecturer, really, to give the basic, basic biology of inflammation to people, and was gracious to allow me to borrow some of his slides. So, at, 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 at a fairly basic level, inflammation is about cells. So, uh, you have professional sort of not just phagocytes but inflammatory cells, and these include early responding cells like mast cells. You think of them, say, if you an allergic type response, but they're important for everything. We just recently had a, uh, I was co-author on a paper in false medicine that's implicating mast cells in the response to trauma. Um, monocytes, which are typically considered the precursors of macrophages, you'll find these predominantly in the blood circulation and uh, they come from the bone marrow, and then they'll, uh, some of them will take up residence in tissues, they'll differentiate there to become tissue resident macrophages. These are the typical cells that do phagocytosis, which means engulfing of, uh, of, of uh, pathogens of, of, of any sort. But also they'll be the, 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 the people, the, the cells that clean up the, the mess in a, in a, in a after, after uh, a, a, an inflammatory response. Sort of for a long time they were thought to just be the garbage cans of, of the body and not really given the, the, the respect they were actually, uh, that they were actually due. Uh, neutrophils are also uh, found in the circulation and will, and will infiltrate injured or infected cells. So that you have already a set of cells there that begin the initial process of inflammation, but these cells will infiltrate in there. Um, and then you have the dendritic cells, which are similar to macrophages and are often, are typically tissue resident, but again, they've got to get there from somewhere else. And the dendritic cells are the bridge cell between uh, the, the innate immune aspect of which is sort of the evolutionarily earlier uh, evolved uh, version of inflammation, which does the initial alarm, the initial response. And, as a, and the dendritic cells act as a bridge to the so-called adaptive response, which is what we think of when we say immunology, so antigen-specific responses, which are less broad and more focused to what's actually uh, hitting you, what your real problem is. Of course, that can go wrong because some of that, that, some of that ends up happening as a reaction to your own tissues or molecules of your own that are floating around in, in your own body uh, or become uncovered under some circumstances and that's what we call autoimmune disease. Um, again, we can go quite into depth on that if people uh, want. Uh, the other important part is to realize your body is kind of like a, like a Switzerland or an Israel. Um, every citizen can be an inflammatory cell. So your, your, pretty much every cell in your body can do some inflammatory uh, function. And that's useful. It also can be bad because that means that at any moment some cell in your body could take up in, uh, arms and start shooting around and that might not be uh, exactly what you want at that moment. Um, so hopefully that's clear. Now these cells uh, make mediators. So the cells themselves do some stuff like the engulfing of bacteria for example, but a lot of what they do is to communicate. And uh, they, to do that, they, they, they do that using specific molecules which we call um, cytokines. There's other types of mediators as well, free radicals, uh, various other molecules that are being made. But for the time being, we're just going to focus on uh, cytokines, which are small secreted proteins and that, that mediate and regulate inflammation uh, and immunity. Uh, they are really either the letters or the words of the language of inflammation. Uh, they're made by many cell populations. The predominant producers, though, are, are these macrophages and the helper T cells. So the helper T cells are, again, part of the adaptive arm or help to drive the adaptive arm, but everything is a cascade, so I'll talk about it shortly. Um, so these cytokines generally must be produced uh, de novo or anew in response to an immune stimulus, although there are certainly situations 
where there's, uh, your cells have some preformed, some amount of preformed uh, mediators that they can release, but uh, generally they have to be rapidly transcribed, translated, and then secreted. Um, they typically act over short distances and short time spans. Now, I think this is not entirely true, right? So it turns out that cytokines like TNF and IL-1 are also neurotransmitters and can actually be passed down axons. And so there's a distinct possibility that some of these can go over very long distances as well. Um, and so this entire idea is, is maybe coming into some, some question. Um, and, and again, the way these, these, these proteins work is they, they bind to receptors, which then trigger signaling cascades and, and alter gene expression. Now there's an, an, a, a related but separate category of these inflammatory mediators that are called DAMs damage uh, associated molecular pattern molecules. They're basically uh, these dual phase uh, molecules or fractions or fragments of molecules, which is during, the, during normal working hours, they are carrying out uh, housekeeping functions of the cell. They might be doing some function in the nucleus um, on stabilizing DNA, or they may be doing uh, standard functions, uh, even in the extracellular matrix, they might even be outside the cell. But under situations of stress, uh, or damage, or cell death, they, they get released. So now the body recognizes this presence of self components in, a, in the wrong place as alarm or danger or stress. And that's really important. So DAMPS, the, the discovery of DAMPS, and by the way, the person who really discovered the first DAMP, HMGE1, is Kevin Tracy. So it's the same guy who then connected the loop to, to, the, to the brain inflammatory control that I mentioned. So Kevin published a seminal paper in 1999 in Science uh, talking about HMGV1, a prototypical uh, damn uh, nuclear factor that, when released, stimulates the production of prototypical pro-inflammatory cytokines. Uh, and as I said, some, sometimes the breakdown of the extracellular matrix or fragments of the matrix can also be damps, and they relate to maybe invasiveness of cells or cells that are producing a lot of um, toxic uh, enzymes that can damage uh, the area around them. Well, that causes the release of some of these the proteolytic cleavage, cleavage, some of the, the release of these fragments, which then are interpreted as my homeostasis has been disrupted. You know, so um, so this is the cry for help. This is the cry. Damps are really the the, the system crying for help. Your right. dams are really like just residue? Like when you have apoptosis, the cell dies, then among the components that come out of that, you automatically get your, you get your dams? Or they're actively generated? So actually apoptosis is almost the prototypical wrong example to use for that. So apoptosis is actually anti-inflammatory or non-inflammatory. Apoptosis is as ubiquitous as it is because precisely that it does not cause inflammation. So as part of patterning and development, we use apoptosis. And if we had massive inflammation as part of that, it wouldn't really work. Right. So actually necrosis or various other osis that have now been uh, you know, claimed as separate processes do cause inflammation. Pyroptosis, there's a bunch of others. Apoptosis is actually a very specific case where the, the, it seems as if you have a special compartmentalized and separate mechanism to, to to get rid of cells that are non-functioning in a quiet way. They're just grabbed up by the guys with the, with, the, with the Bluetooth headsets and taken quietly to a nice island in the Caribbean where they're interned. <laughs> so the, the, it's, 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 a, it's a very, and you, sh, you know, no one gets to report about that. Okay, so that, that, that's apoptosis. But every other type of, of, of cell death, and really not just death, stress, it's a reversible stress. A, a stress where a cell is being taken out of its context, but not enough to kill it, it's secreting these things. And actually it's secreting them sometimes at fairly high level. And then if you take that stimulus away, they'll stop secreting and it can actually survive it. But now if you go beyond a certain threshold, the cell will actually die, and then you get an even bigger release of these. Okay. Things. Now, and, and again, there's a lot of complexity in that. They're actually packaged into exosomes and other types of vesicles, so that it's not just a massive diffusion. We now know that actually cytokines are also encapsulated in exosomes. So the entire process has a lot more complexity, but I'm just trying to give a general overview so that people can kind of get their frame of reference. And you would have no questions. And I will have no questions. Exactly. Well, like I want questions, so there you go. So that tells you that I'm mostly wrong. Um, so so I, I show you all these things because I'm trying to give you what the current dogma is so that you'll understand why I'm deconstructing it, okay? Um, you have to know 
what things are before you call, you know, offer an alternative. So the it's very linear the way people think about inflammation. So there's some kind of an initiating stimulus, like an injury or infection, mast cells get activated, then you get this cascade, everything's a feed forward cascade. There's macrophages, there's neutrophils, or monocytes can, can, can come in, then these other types of cells that I didn't mention called natural killer cells get activated, all that leads to the activation of dendritic cells, and then that leads to this T cell side of the response, which is classical immunology, okay? You notice there's not a single arrow that feeds back, everything's linear forward, Okay, this is how the typical inflammation biologist, and I will put most clinicians into that camp, think, right? I'm showing it because, yeah, at some level, when you look at what's out there, it will look to you like this is what's going on, okay? But what I think is going on is kind of more like this, right? So, yeah, you can see why nobody likes it. So the, the, the key part to focus on is the stuff that I conveniently put in red. Um, this is a positive feedback. So let's imagine what happens here. You have some sort of an injury or an infection. Damps are being produced. Ignore the names of the mediators right now, but just think about what's happening. You get a simultaneous presence of basically nominally pro and nominally anti-inflammatory influences. I'll show you some data to kind of, to kind of hold them back this up. This is not how people typically think. People think you have a pro-inflammatory response that tends followed by an anti-inflammatory response because gosh, that's how I, I first turn on the light, then I've got to turn off the light. I can't simultaneously turn on the light and turn off the light. It doesn't make any sense. But the reality is when you actually look at the data is that the two arms are going at almost the same time. I mean, as best as we can measure, it's the same time. And a whole lot of, a whole lot of immunology and inflammation biology, and I would argue biology, works exactly like this. You get multiple choices at the same, it's like two directions as one. Things are happening at the same time. And actually there's a lot of value to that. Um, we can discuss what some of that value is, but for, for now just suspend this belief and believe me that I think this is how this works. Now the next thing that happens is you get these cells that are the, the professional phagocytes, if you will, and they're making these, these cytokines. The cytokines uh, do two things. One of the things they do early on is they activate the, an additional layer of anti also known as N2, although this, this, this is going away some, but these are reparative type of responses. So you already are getting the first seeds of repair just as the, you're also doing the destruction, right? You're, you're delivering aid at around the same time that you're blowing the village up, okay? So the, the and, and there's other anti-inflammatory cytokines that get made. Well, what do they do? Well, they block, right? So their job is to start blocking, and the starting of the blocking is happening right away. Um, now you have a whole lot of different indices for dysfunction or damage. It's either at the cellular level, at the tissue level, at the organ level, at the whole organism level. Um, you're starting to go downhill in some fashion and we can come up with all kinds of measures of that. And importantly, when you do that, your cells are stressed. When they're stressed, they're making more dams. When they're making more dams, they're activating more inflammation. So now you've got this positive feedback loop and this gets going. And this can get going quite a bit, right? And again, because this is the reparative arm, this is not, fighting that, right? It's trying to repair and stop. Why? Because if you, can if you can fix the health status, you'll stop the inflammation, right? And you notice that if you get this going long enough, it doesn't matter anymore when you had your injury or that even you had an injury. You could end up with a self-sustaining inflammatory response, which we call critical illness, and you could stay in the intensive care unit for weeks, months at a time, um, and nobody remembers anymore that you got injured in the first place. Right. That's really important that, that this is how the system wired, and that's what it results in. Now let's think about what happens here. This is a very major central ear um, that activates the dendritic cells and a whole set of other responses that are T-cell mediated. Importantly, this happens kind of fast, spins up very fast. It has the potential to spin down very, very fast, but most of the time it doesn't. This takes a little longer to come up, although now we know it's not a ton longer. Uh, in, in, in dynamic settings like, like trauma, but, but a bit longer. But importantly, this takes a really long time to turn on, right? So the reason that people look at autoimmune diseases and say it's all T cells, it's because this is what's left over that you can really easily see, right? But it's actually being driven by a chronic restarting of this, so I think. So I think that in my opinion, acute inflammation is a chronic restarting of, acute, uh, chronic inflammation is a chronic restarting of acute inflammation. There's a lot of there's a lot of thought about this. For example, the failed trial of anti-TNF, which we modeled in that paper that I just, that I mentioned, 
That failure in sepsis, which is you know, a lot of the early events, turned out to be the godsend for rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis and lots of other, so anti-TNF is a frontline drug for those diseases. I think it's not for anything magic, but just because these take longer to come up, but they take way longer to come down. So as long as you're constantly hitting this loop, eventually this will come down too, right? It, it just makes logical sense. Now, at a macro level, there, there are this bigger production of anti-inflammatory mediators that serve to try to dampen all of this. Um, and then let's not think about some of this other stuff, but basically, you can put a box around this part of it and call it innate immune responses, and you can put a box around some of this and call it B-cell mediated or adaptive immunity, but it's all one big integrated system. Right. So, so Which yeah. also, at the, a sort of the microscopic scale, is continuously acting. It's continuously right. acting. Because there's continuous damage somewhere. And there's always thresholds, so there's continuous damage, but not every time that I bump my arm against the wall am I gonna start going into critical illness. Mm -hmm. it, that could not be evolutionarily sustainable. So the point is that you, it's always about threshold, right? which of course naturally maps to mathematical models. This, this thing about two branches going off at the same time is a very natural thing for a system that you don't want to, to, to expose to the danger of actually uh, run away. Uh, if you do plus and minus at the same time, you have balance and you have a tension between them, and you can climb up to whatever level you want to. It is like the like the parental cells inhibit or interneurons in cortex, they are locked in an unbelievably strong uh, mutual uh, uh, embrace yes. of inhibition and excitation, and that's what keeps them from going into epilepsy, for example. Yeah, as I said, I, I really believe the, the biology is really organized around this, and that only human beings looking at it afterwards and trying to impose their will on how the system works say, well, it makes logical sense. Well, first of all, inflammation is bad. So then the, the, the baseline state is nothing happens. Then inflammation happens, well, because it's bad, we gotta shut it off. Right? What I'm saying is, like what Paul said, it's happening all the time. You're responding all the time. You're responding to uh, microparticles in the air, stress from being up here giving a talk, you know, whatever, you're constantly responding, right? So, um, okay, so it's a little more complex. So what does that lead to? So, we, so one thing I really love about Tim Billier is he really doesn't understand what we do but he has an intuitive sense of how the system operates. So, um, and, and I say that not, not to make a joke in any way, it's actually how I think the difference between clinicians that kind of can get what we do and the ones that can't. Um, because this picture I'm gonna show you, he came up with without thinking, and he has no knowledge of how mathematical models operate, right? So this is his concept of, of appropriate or adequate inflammation. He drew this just like on the back of a napkin and he made it into a better picture. Um, the, the, there's a lot of features about this that already are different from the way typical people think about this. First, this is nonlinear. Second, you start here, you resolve, but you never come back to being who you were. Right? So at some level of our argumentation, it's easy to, to show it for chronic inflammatory diseases or for someone who's been in the ICU for two months, but I think it's the same thing a microsecond from now. Right? You're never coming back to being Right? And, and you're always, that next step, you're already worse off than you were before. And that's how you get old, and, uh, and that's why a lot of what, a lot of what aging does uh, is associated with changes in inflammation. So the time scale here could be microseconds or decades. So this sets also some boundaries, right? So it suggests there's a range during, your, you know, so across this range, as long as you're within this range, it's, it's compatible with unassisted life. And I say unassisted life because it means life where you don't need a medical system, intensive care units, drugs to keep you alive or to get you away from some break and back to being alive, right? So it's, let's call it the evolutionary uh, uh, sort of range for being alive. This is what people typically think of when they say inflammation, which means really over, overly exuberant inflammation. This is what, if you were doing a mathematical simulation of a simple model with feedback, if you had positive feedback dominating, right? Sorry, oh. mm -hmm. this button is So this is uh, overly exuberant, um, overly exuberant inflammation, right? And this can lead to this kind of immune dysregulation and, and persistent critical illness, et cetera. Okay. Then you have this inadequate one, which is just too little, right? And most people don't pay attention to that. Um, too little inflammation is bad too. And this also leads to an immune dysregulation and also can lead to persistent 
Um, I should also mention a lot of this was also done by, uh, by Ron, I mean, a lot of the, the, this was done by Rami Hamas and, and he's the first author of this review article. Um, so that, this also brings up a couple of, of other interesting things here. So we have a couple of uh, points. So you're saying that is actually too much positive feedback. Right? This is too much negative feedback. And it also suggests that over here, or maybe over here, you have some interesting points where you might be able to get a diagnosis about where you're headed. And also these are maybe regulatory points, control points. Um, and the real interesting question now is, is this the space during which neural control really matters? Uh, is it, it, I mean, obviously it matters over the entire range, but is this the place where neural control actually matters? Which is when in, in, the, in the constant decision is, should I go all the way to over exuberant inflammation or do I not, uh, am I misreading the situation and I'm not putting out enough inflammation? If I don't do that, I don't heal. Um, so you're stuck between these sort of uh, hard limits, if you will. So a few years back, uh, we put out uh, this paper uh, in Frontiers, uh, and again, that was uh, Giannis, Andrew Lakis, I mentioned before, Ted, Dick, and John Doyle, and along with several, and Gary, on and several other people, really trying to get across this idea that the system is a multi-scale system. It's got a multi-scale architecture. It is, um, it is intertwined with physiology and neural control. And um, I'll talk about this in more, in more uh, some of the parts of this in more detail. But just to say that these were, were the seeds for my real interest in, in, in the neural control information were, were sort of coming from. So an important thing about when you have this type of multi-scale architecture and positive feedback, or the fight between positive and negative feedback, is that it sets up the, the possibility of multi-scale tipping points. So, so this idea that health, it looks like multiple levels maintaining dynamic control, kind of just balance, you know, like you're balancing on a, on a log or a bongo board, okay? It's a dynamic process to, to maintain that balance, but that when things go wrong, the inherent positive feedback nature of the system sets you up for cascading system failure, right? Which in the sepsis and trauma field or critical illness, we call that multiple organ dysfunction or multiple organ failure if it goes past a certain point, right? And then the idea is, how do you get at this? How, where, how can you fix this? If, if the cows have already left the barn, is it useful to go back and now close the barn door? Probably not, right? Like, you'd like to keep the barn door locked if you could do that, if you could know that this was impending. But once they've left the barn, coming back and spending time and effort locking the barn is not very useful. In fact, you can argue at a teleologic level that you're blocking the cows from ever coming back into the barn um, should they somehow decide they want to. Um, so, so the point is, of course, that medical care is absolutely almost always a day late and a dollar short, right? It's almost always for a euro short, or a euro 22 short. Um, the, the, the point is that you, you, you really need diagnosis and, and sensing to be able to figure out which of these layers is currently being disrupted and how far into the system you are and realize there's a lot of motive force. So once, it's, once entire layers are broken through, that snowball is really rolling downhill and it's gonna get very hard to make it come back up. So, so these are important concepts. So now let's talk a little bit about some specifics. So I'm gonna talk about a couple of contexts. So the, the first one's trauma. So just to give you a sense, trauma is really an important uh, health issue. It's uh, kind of the leading cause of death in people over 50. Um, and there's associated things like traumatic spinal cord injury uh, or traumatic brain injury that are related to that, and we'll talk about these. The nice thing, the really great thing about just the natural evolution of medical care is that nowadays about 95% of people that get even severely injured uh, will make it through. That's the same thing in the civilian population as it is in the military population, just with the civilian population being sort of older and baseline sicker, uh, but injured less, whereas the civilian population is younger, healthier, but injured way more. Uh, but my colleagues in the military have about the same experience. It's about a 95% survival rate, which is great. The problem is that the remaining 5% is very refractory to change. And I think that, that that's a, the core of the problem because I think you're dealing with hard limits in evolution. So the point is, once you have this traumatic injury, we know that it induces an inflammatory response, which is, it has an associated immune dysregulation. This immune dysregulation kind of opens a door for there to be infection. Infection can lead, and, 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 and inflammation will lead to multiple organ dysfunction and failure, which itself makes more inflammation. And then eventually, 4 to 5% of people 
done. Now, the, the problem is that the 95% of people that live go off afterwards, but they don't really have the life they had before. Right? They'll have many, many uh, aspects of morbidity, and in fact, they'll be more likely to die later on. Too, right? So just remember this next time you want to do something reckless, like driving your car very recklessly, because uh, motor vehicle accidents are probably the number one reason that this happens, more so than that. So let's break this down into a really simple cartoon of the prior cartoon that I showed. This is how I think um, this is what happens in trauma, okay? You're injured, the, in the injury damages a bunch of tissue, which means that it's releasing damps. The damps activate an inflammatory response, and that makes more damage, and sets you up for this damage to inflammation to damage vicious cycle. At the same time, we know injury will cause a catecholamine burst. That's uh, kind of morally regulated, but we already know that. You'll have a catecholamine burst, which drives an anti-inflammatory burst, um, whose job it is to, uh, to counter the uh, pro-inflammatory burst, but then itself is being stimulated by the pro-inflammatory side of things. But as remember what I said, the anti-inflammatory part is also the pro-healing part, and so it's there to fix the damage. Okay? This is just the simplest possible version, I think, of an inflammatory response. Um, the problem is, you notice I put the arrows not in the same thickness because, in general, the pro-inflammatory side of things tends to win, and you end up in a state of persistent damage or dysfunction. Again, we call that critical illness, and it's really hard to get a patient off of that. I would argue that some of the way that it happens is almost completely stochastic. It just happens to have just the right set of supportive care decisions that's made, in the right hospital by the doctor that has just the right level of experience, more so than uh, any actual advance. There's currently not a single drug approved for modulating the biology of, of what I've just showed here in the context of trauma, right? There, there, there just isn't. Uh, it's all supportive care. Fluids being given to you, blood being given to you if you've lost a lot of blood, things like that. It's incredibly, it's incredibly primitive, actually. Um, okay. So that's a great conceptual model. Like, I can talk my way through explaining all kinds of features of stuff. But the question is, does this ever show up? Can you ever prove that this even happens? So uh, in 2011, we published a method uh, that we call DINA, Dynamic Network Analysis. Just a way, a very straight correlation-based method to look at the evolution of dynamic networks or the evolution of networks dynamically. Um, we, did, we showed that we could, refer, we could look at some features of trauma hemorrhage in mice, and then we went to apply it in people. And we did it in a very particular set of people. Um, this is uh, Andrew Abood, a student, uh, first undergraduate, and now a medical student in the lab. And we wanted to look at the biggest possible outcome difference, which is living versus dying. And as, this was part of a prospective collection of data that we did, about 500 patients, 493 patients to be exact, observe, uh, where we collected extensive data, uh, multiple blood draws in the first 24 hours and then out to daily to seven days and then somewhat less frequency and uh, frequently until discharge. And then all the clinical data, we measured many inflammatory mediators in the blood. Um, and then we, we used that data to generate uh, these dynamic networks. Um, and lo and behold, we found something. So ignoring the, any given mediator, we found something pretty amazing. From as soon as we could measure, and we could measure within a couple of hours or less sometimes uh, uh, after injury, the network evolution of people that went on to die was completely different from the network evolution of people that went on to live. And the people that went on to live were not just walking away. These were propensity matched subjects that were as, as equal as possible as they could be to the ones that went on to die. In the paper that we published, we showed just how equal they really were, down to the body region and severity of injury, comorbidities, everything that you could imagine, of course, age uh, and, 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 and the gender makeup. So that's really pretty cool. So because this looks exactly like what I was showing here, right? If I was looking at uh, the inadequate versus the overly exuberant, right? I couldn't have, I could, I, I, I couldn't have possibly mapped it better. I realized nobody here has adequate inflammation. Again, everybody's ending up in the ICU for at least a week. Okay, another important thing is I'm not going to talk about, but looking at this very, very early time frame, 
can already find evidence for the activation of a T cell pathway, the TH17 pathway, which previously had been only implicated in chronic inflammatory disease. And I think that helps to also validate another part of my hypothesis, which is that the T cell mediated arm is being activated almost simultaneously with the so-called innate mediated arm, okay, which fits into that picture that I showed. All right. Um, just as an important, just as important as this is the fact that if we use metrics of multiple organ dysfunction, which are not the same metrics as the ones we use to generate these networks, you can see that organ dysfunction tracks the same way. So the organ dysfunction rises in these non-survivors, and at the time that is insurmountable when they die, um, whereas in the survivors it stays fairly constant. Okay. So again, that's important because there's a lot of people that say because they failed at trying to change any outcomes in trauma by using anti-inflammatory mediators to say inflammation really doesn't have anything to do with, with the outcomes. It's just an epiphenomenon. What's Marshall score? So the Marshall score is a, is a way of quantifying uh, uh, dysfunction in different body, in different body compartments, different body systems. So neurological dysfunction, liver dysfunction, kidney dysfunction. So and it's fully objective? Yeah, it's a numerical system. It's not perfect because, especially the head injury part of it, uh, which uses the Glasgow Coma Scale is problematic, especially if you end up having patients that are sedated or, or comatose when they come in. So the, you know, that part can, can be a little subjective. The rest of it is based on biochemical parameters. So. But none of it, as I say, it's very important to note that none of it is correlated, to, none of it is using data that, that are inflammatory in, in any way. So you're not, it's not like I'm just simply showing you a teleology. They're, I'm using the same data and I'm getting the same data. Um, so again, network complexity tracks with multiple organ failure, and, and it's also important for the people that had been trying to find a magic bullet to fix this, that no single inflammatory mediator does this. This is about the network. Okay, so um, were we missing something? So I was looking around for a, for a neuroscience quote, and as a not, a, made, made by a non-neuroscientist, and I found this. And I think it's kind of apropos to the people I work with, but you know, just, just take a look at it. Right, so yeah. I mean, the people that I work with, um, probably, well, me, maybe. Uh, all right, so coming back to this picture, what was my, you know, how did we further kind of delve into this? Well, an important piece here is this anti-inflammatory mediator that I didn't talk about before. This is interleukin 10. And it's near and dear to my heart because, so this is my very first paper, and it's currently still my most highly cited paper. It, it's uh, from the prehistory, you know, in 1991. Uh, when science was still good, arguably. Um, and uh, it, it, we helped discover that interleukin 10 was really important uh, and perhaps central in uh, blocking inflammation in, in, in the eye tissue. We followed that up with some mechanistic and comparative studies, etc. Um, so we actually ended up looking at this. It was uh, IL-10 is in the panel of mediators we look at. And here's a bunch of data from a, a study that really was transformative for me, which is, I was involved in a, in a collaborative study in a, in, a, in a consortium that was looking at uh, spinal cord injury patients. They were trauma patients with spinal cord injury. So that was the inclusion criteria. The exclusion criteria of my big trauma study was spinal cord injury. So at some point that we had enough data, we said, geez, we, and they were collected in basically the same hospital. So we said, let's compare. Right, because everybody was there were papers about what happens in spinal cord injury as far as inflammation is concerned. And you could definitely find and said there's an inflammatory response. And of course, we have the papers about what happens following trauma. But I said, what happens if you actually compare the two? We find something really striking. So the first thing is that IL-10 levels are much much higher in the patients with spinal cord injury versus the patients without. Very significantly higher. Um, Tracking the that? two groups again, spinal cord, spinal cord injury or non-spinal cord injury. Okay. But it's not non-spinal cord injury, any old controls. They're patients that were matched for injury severity. They're both trauma patients. It's just one happens to be with a spinal cord transection and one without. Right. So you kind of sense where I'm heading to. Right. So <laughs> the, 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 the interesting thing was that the chemokine IP10 uh, tracked along with this pretty well. It's important to note that, that a central inflammatory mediator, IL-1 beta, which I mentioned before, as one of the ones that's also neurally regulated, was much higher in the trauma patients than in the uh, spinal cord injury patients. So now, only because you can step back and actually have the access to the data, you can now say that actually 
although there's an inflammatory response to spinal cord injury, it is really hypoinflamed. They are hypoinflamed compared to trauma patients. We did some network analysis that I'm not going to show, but it suggested that IP10 was helping to drive IO10, and hence the title of the paper which we published in 2014. Right. But this to me was the first, to, to, I mean, the real next step in the line of starting to think about why I need to be thinking about a neural control of inflammation. Because now I can see this. Uh, behavior in the patients we were actually So now let's take a, just a slight little detour to talk about another disease, which is very related. So sepsis. Sepsis, just like trauma, also leads to critical illness. Um, so uh, I'm fortunate to be at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, we, are, we have probably one of the only, and I would say maybe the best Department of Critical Care Medicine in the world. Uh, Derek Angus, our chair, is uh, widely known in the, in the sort of uh, sepsis epidemiology literature. This paper came out in JAMA uh, just recently. Uh, Chris Seymour is the first author. We've been collaborating with Chris, and hopefully there'll be a paper going to JAMA with him uh, uh, from our group as well um, soon. Uh, but anyway, this is the current state of the art in defining what sepsis is. Um, anybody who's interested can look. But the epidemiology is really pretty bad. It's uh, a lot of people. Um, it's mostly in the elderly, uh, and of course we've got a population that's getting older, and uh, that will mean that the incidence will increase significantly, and that's not including pandemic you know, influenza and other related diseases that also essentially fall into sepsis and, um, and uh, require ICU care. Um, and just like trauma, it's associated with altered inflammation and multiple organ dysfunction, with a high morbidity and a high cost, there used to be one FDA-approved therapy besides supportive care, just as an aside. The way that that therapy ended up being uh, approved, and especially then for a secondary trial that was mandated in the EU, uh, involved the, the company Immunetrix that we started. So Eli Lilly, who did this, actually simulated the trial with, with, with Immunetrix as an aside. Um, and like trauma, the response to sepsis comprises a sort of multi-system uh, and multi-scale complex. Now, we can cartoonify this too, and you'll see that it actually looks not that different from trauma. So there's your bacterial infection. <coughs> it sets in motion inflammation directly. This is necessary because without it, you're not going to kill the infection. So that's your prototypical evolutionarily conserved mechanism. You've got to kill bacteria. Right? Um, but the price you pay is you damage yourself. You release damps, damps make more inflammation. Right? And again, you could do such a great job of killing those bacteria, but yet go above a certain threshold here, and now you're left with self-sustaining inflammation, but the bacteria are all gone. And one feature of sepsis is they can't detect bacteria in like 50% of patients. But they know, they know they had sepsis. And they blame the fact that the, the fact that the culture tests are not sufficiently sensitive. <laughs> but I think this says that in some percent of the patients, you'll never see them. We can, we've actually are proving that in rats. Um, again, just as an aside. Um, the point is then, this just like in trauma induces this anti-inflammatory response. They counter each other. They, they drive, it, it, it drives a healing process as well. Again, I'm drawing the arrows, not an equal side, because this again leads to persistent damage Okay, how does sepsis occur? Sepsis is driven by many things, but typically bacteria. There are two kinds of bacteria, roughly speaking, gram-positive bacteria and gram-negative bacteria. They're sort of distinguished by their, by their um, uh, molecular properties. A key molecule in bacteria that are gram-negative is endotoxin or the polysaccharide. And it's a, it's a major component in the, in, the, in the outer membrane. And as a general metabolic uh, outcome of, of bacterial metabolism, but also bacterial killing, you're going to be releasing endotoxin. The body is exquisitely sensitive to endotoxin. Uh, you will mount a very strong inflammatory response to endotoxin. Uh, when you do that, just cartoon, uh, it's kind of a little bit complex. This is actually a simple version of that. There are multiple molecules, including serum proteins that help shepherd the LPS2 receptor. The key receptor is called like receptor 4. Um, you can also have, uh, you have a role for a thing called CD14. It can either be there on cells, or it can be in the circulation and then come on to cells that normally respond to LPS and can give them LPS responses. And prototypically, you induce what's called the nuclear factor kappa B pathway, or NF kappa B, which 
drives the production of things like TNF and I1, but many other things as well. Okay, clearly much more than that goes on, but we can abstract it this way. And so I became intrigued by the idea of, okay, what happens when you do this? Now this is a very prototypical uh, system, experimental system. People do it with cells, they do it with animals, they even in some cases do it with people. For, uh, it's a very, uh, obviously, highly regulated and, and, and difficult system to do in people, uh, but, but there's a data on human volunteers. Um, but I said, what, what's known to happen with LPS is LPS is sort of like the Big Bang when it comes into the body, right? It comes in, and you're going to get a massive cascade of activation and inflammation in many, many this relates to what Paul was saying at the beginning, which is that um, at some point you have to account for how this impacts, how, how an inflammatory stimulus ripples across the body and how that is in turn regulated. Um, and it turns out nobody had actually looked in a systematic fashion uh, across all organs, across time, and across many inflammatory diseases. And so we said, let's, let, let's do that. Um, so we looked at multiple tissues as well as the blood, the plasma, uh, which is what we do. We, we spin down the blood for each plasma for detection of inflammatory mediators. Um, and so this is the study that we, that we did. So, and this was really run by Ruben. Um, we did it in mice. Uh, this is a prototypical, we'll call it wild type mouse, C57 black 6. We gave them very pure LPS and, multiple, uh, and, we, and we harvested mice at multiple time points. Um, and then we got all these different tissues. Um, just to prove to ourselves that this was real, we have the wild type mice and we also have the mice deficient in TLR4, which is the receptor for LPS. And you can see that some prototypical responses like some kind of TNF, they're, they're made to a nice extent in the wild type mouse, they're highly blunted, in, but not completely eliminated in the TLR4 knockout. So there are actual other receptor systems for, for LPS as well. Um, this uh, results in um, organ dysfunction that we can measure as these circulating liver enzymes like ALT, AST. They're, they're basically not damps, but they're markers of post, you know, where you, the cell's gone beyond stress to real cell damage and then being released. So it's, it's, a, it's a marker of organ dysfunction. Okay, now, we use principal component analysis on the data from these various tissues. So we, we lumped it all together into one big data set and we did principal component analysis across time, um, uh, in time intervals. So we call it time interval PCA. Um, it generates a very large uh, stacked bar graph where we, what we do is we take the, the loadings in the, uh, in the PCA space and stack them up and then put the mediator with the biggest loadings first and then everything is smaller after that. So we can build this uh, sort of histogram. And then we, we can sort of quantify that. And that's where we got this picture. So the basic story in the wild type mouse is that inflammation seems to progress from the spleen, then show up in the blood, and then later in the heart, and the liver, and the gut, and the lungs. Okay, and these are the curves that sort of help us to come up with this picture because we're basically just looking about kind of where, when, when things start, and when they peak, and when they, when they decline. Now, when we look at the TLR4 knockout mice, remember what I said, they don't have zero inflammation. They have inflammation. A lot less. Um, we actually get a very different picture, and I don't know if we could argue. So the the, wild, the, the, T, the C57 mice are considered Th1 dominant, so they're actually almost like a hypo or a hyperinflammatory mouse, even though people consider them wild type. Um, it's possible that these mice are actually more like adequate inflammation, but um, we now find a very different sequence where we see things in the blood and then the lungs. Are we also constructed dynamic networks. So using our Dyna tool, we constructed dynamic networks across all these organs with the hope of actually seeing some sort of a, 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 a vision where the networks across organs all of a sudden look like what we see in the plasma. And you can say, haha, this is when systemic inflammation finally occurs, is when the spillover from the organs begins to show up in the plasma and then they look the same. We really didn't see that at all, actually. We saw very distinct patterns. Um, and we even saw some interesting things where TLR4 knockout actually had better network organization than the, than the so-called wild type in, in, in certain settings, like, um, for example, in the spleen. Um, so this was interesting. Uh, it suggests that most of the time, as you'd expect, you're just getting higher network density 
mice that are able to respond to LPS in the canonical pathway, but some that aren't, and this suggests the possibility of looking at specific time points and specific tissues for the presence of non-canonical LPS signaling. And so we're, we're following that up right now, but I'm not gonna uh, take more time about that. The, the important thing is that it led me to this interaction with Paul because we, Ruben was presenting this at the meeting in Caltech, and I really got fascinated by the intersection of the ideas about the brain, about the idea of networks of networks, about the idea of trying to figure out how the system is wired together. And Paul said, why don't you guys just do this basic analysis first, this massive sort of cross-correlation analysis, and just look for the pattern and see if that tells you anything. And what we found is that really, in the wild type mouse, if you look from about four, uh, four to six hours on, you start seeing patterns in the organ that you could argue across time reflect what is being seen in the plasma, okay? And so that suggests that somewhere in that time period is when systemic inflammation actually begins to occur because the plasma looks kind of like the rest of the organ. Um, again, as a multi-dimensional matrix of, of media. <coughs> Whereas in the TLR4 knockout, in the TLR4 knockout, you just don't see it. And so then this leads to the hypothesis that systemic spillover occurs once neural control of local that, that's kind of where we are at now with this discussion with Paul, and also now I've talked to Kevin Tracy, and we want to try to get at this with some experiments. Um, so the idea is that we can now define it, we can give it some quantitative you know, information, we can find it in where and when this seems to be happening, and then we have a very specific hypothesis that we can able to test. There's a sub-hypothesis which I don't know if it's true, but that you, there might be actually a TLR4 regulation which would be very interesting because TLR4 does a lot of other stuff besides uh, regulating inflammation induced by LPS. It actually responds to dams too, and it's important in development. It's important in various other processes. So there could be a very well likely a situation where uh, TLR4 in the brain matters too. The discovery most very recently in the last couple of weeks of essentially these channels that can get information to the brain without the breakdown of the blood-brain barrier uh, suggests that there could be actually even more active transport and back and forth. And this needs to be tested. Um, I don't know I'm doing. Am I, am I really late on time? Because I started late, but I'm... No, you're still fine. Yeah? I, so this brings us to this, this idea that the brain is maybe building an abstraction there about what's happening. And, and I think we, you, for you guys, this is not a new thing, but I thought putting it together in words that I can understand from the computer world, which I had a little bit of interaction with. And the idea of the, of the abstraction layer was, you know, it's one of the things that made operating systems much more uh, robust, which is the, building, the system is building a conceptual model of itself. Um, and then, for example, for the people like my MD colleagues, a, 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 a simple visualization is, you know, you put your USB disk in, with the, the operating system builds a model of what it means to have a USB disk inserted, and then when you gotta remove it, you go to eject it, and it says, yep, it's okay, nothing's gonna crash when you do that. Um, if you use Windows, it says no, and then, uh, then you have to be pissed off and reboot your system, and then you eject your stuff. But the bottom line is it's probably doing it for a reason, because it thinks it's gonna crash. Uh, for those history buffs, I think this came up uh, on the Windows side with Windows NT, I think the Mac OS was probably doing it a bit before that. Um, so, but this really solved the crashing problem in earlier versions of Windows and so forth. Because you know, you just didn't pull the disk out and have this amount of crash occur. So the question is, is the brain doing something similar as far as inflammation is concerned? Is the brain basically building uh, a map of what's happening at different organs as far as inflammation is concerned? And if I was needing to build a map, I would want to do it in the most parsimonious way possible. I would want to use exactly the same mediators that I already use for inflammation, I would want to use them in the brain to build a map of the inflammation. I'd want to put it in regions of the brain that are affecting or uh, impacting the physiology of that particular organ. Um, that would make logical sense to me. Um, and, and there's some evidence for this. So again, getting back to Kevin Tracy's work, um, he has pointed to the nucleus tractus solitaris, solitaris for this as a, as a place where vagal control and inflammation control occurs. Um, very recently, I was at the Feinstein Institute where Kevin is, and I gave a talk and I met with people, and uh, I, they showed me this paper that was just then published in PNAS. I really urge you to potentially look at this. 
What they did here is they could detect distinct nerve impulses in the vagus of mice if you were to actually give uh, IL-1 or TNF alpha systemically. So they could deconvolute this with uh, some, uh, some classifiers. Um, to help prove that this is true, you could use mice that were deficient in IL-1 beta, and then you could eliminate the IL-1 beta specific signals, but not the TNF specific signals. Um, and then uh, they were able to, to, uh, to emulate the IL-1 specific uh, signals when they eliminated uh, trip B1. So this paper is just out of very recent. But actually, my other collaborators, Ted Dick and Frank Giacomo, had shown already back in 2011 in that, that when they gave LPS into the lungs of, of rats, that they could already find IL-1 beta related changes in the brain. And this was without there being, they, they gave a low enough level of LPS that there wasn't just systemic uh, levels of LPS like I just showed you. It wasn't going everywhere and also getting into the brain. They could only find it in the lung and they could only find it in the brain uh, in, the, in the NTS. And importantly, that's also the region that's helping uh, control breathing pattern variability. And so they, they could show that breathing pattern variability was diminished at the same time. So the suggestion is that you have inflammation locally, the brain knows about it very fast, uses cytokines that are also inflammatory cytokines to do something, presumably to tell itself, hey, there's I1 in the lung. Um, and the physiology is altered. Now the physiology might be altered as, a, as part of a larger feedback loop to help co correct the system. It's not clear why it happens, or maybe it's just a, an outcome. Um, and they can show this, as I said, they can co-localize uh, IL-1 beta in uh, neurons. I'm not showing this, I could actually see a couple of other cell types like astrocytes and like glia as well. So this may be a more broad phenomenon. And so we're part of an R01 grant with Ted and, and Frank where we're looking at cardiopulmonary uh, patterning and, and the impact on brain uh, inflammation. They're looking at heart rate variability um, and cardio-ventilatory uh, coupling as outputs. Um, what we're doing um, is trying to come up with dynamic network models of how this happens um, and see if we can make some sort of prognoses uh, in septic humans and rats, um, and then to kind of integrate into a larger model. Um, this is the sort of thing I'm talking about. This is uh, ventilatory pattern uh, being decreased. So the normal uh, rhythm, if you will, is sort of like this, very irregular. Once you give bacteria, uh, gram-negative bacteria to the rats, it now becomes much more regular, right? and so the variability decreases. Um, and importantly, you can again detect I1 beta in multiple tissues, both in, of course in the serum and in the lungs, which is kind of where uh, the, the one big area of focus is, but look at the I1 beta in different regions um, in the brain. And so I'm gonna finalize this this talk sort of to this really fundamental basic concept, which is the fight between uh, positive and negative feedbacks. You can prototypically look at IL-10 versus say IL-1 beta and TNF. Um, but really it's this much larger loop that I talked about before. And then the question is, is this big anti-inflammatory loop really uh, due to neural control? Um, importantly, this brings up many, many new and higher order concepts, like for example, um, is the proper functioning of this system somehow relevant to awareness? I didn't put on there, but I'm learning now, maybe memory. Um, and then also when it goes wrong, realize that the exact neurodegenerative diseases we care about, like Alzheimer's and, and, um, and ALS and, and Parkinson's, they are, they're one of their hallmarks is these uh, cytokines in the brain being overactivated. And the question is, if the brain is chronically constantly needed to regulate inflammation, if that goes wrong because you have too much inflammation that you have to deal with, or your set points are wrong, do you now go into out of control positive feedback and now drive neuro neurodegeneration? Right? So you could imagine all of that. And so I'll just wrap up there. I just say that inflammation modeling is a team sport. I added one theme over the other themes just for the uh, year. Um, I'll be sure to remove that when I go to San Luis. Um, and then, because uh, I don't want to die. And, and, the, and I should mention that um, there's a broad, big team, including a lot of the students from our system. Some other 
pyrometricular nucleus of the hypothalamus has a map of the internal organs, and it goes beyond the tractus no uh, the, the nucleus of the tractus solitarius. It feeds the paraventricular nucleus, and there's a nice little map of spleen and, and all kinds of internal organs there. And it's a, a fellow named Ed Co who, who did that, and you are very unlikely to find it by literature search because I had to write him and get his thesis. I had his thesis, and I can give you all the details. Yeah, I'd be interested to know how that was uh, proven, but I guess yeah, it's well, it was, it was done by pure anatomy. It, okay. It was pure, pure tracing, tracer studies, pure anatomy. So the question was, there is, there is a, a, a topographic map of internal organs in the paraventricular nucleus hypothalamus, which is obviously one very interesting place for you because it, it connects it connects to the, the endocrine system and so on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, 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 that does it also go to the insula? That I don't know. Okay. He, he's, he was only doing hypothalamus, but it, there's a map there. But it goes to the thalamus, you said, right? No, hypothalamus. No, no, but from the hypothalamus, there was a projection of the thalamus, or you? No, the nucleus tracked the solitarius oh. in the brain stem, which you mentioned. Yes. Right. Cool. Other questions? Okay. That's my talk sheet. Sure. and I eliminated all questions. <laughs> That's your show. So I was dreading this, I should say. I'm right. so sorry. Uh, yeah, but I have to do this. Okay. Uh, when we look at inflammation, it seems to me that it's a particular kind of reaction to invasion or things going wrong in, in your body. Yeah. Right? So, in some sense, it seems to me that the purpose of the immune system might be largely to feign or harm bacteria in your body, among other things. To, 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 to harm, harm bacteria. bacteria. Yeah. Farm, farm, farm. Right. farm. Oh, yes. yeah. That's so, we basically, we need uh, bioreactors, uh, and we to perform chemical reactions that your, uh, the cells of your body can uh, perform by themselves. Right. So basically create these bioreactors by farming bacteria. Yes. So it goes very quickly because microbial evolution is very fast. Single cell organisms can be quickly adapted. So you farm them in a particular way and then this farming goes wrong because either you, your brain has some fewer degenerative disease or you have very bad breeding stock after having had an infection or having been exposed to the wrong environment or antibiotics and so on. Right. You might be in trouble. You can have an invasion of the wrong kind of bacteria, so you need to fend them off. And usually you do, do this with a localized method. And when this doesn't work, you basically start bombing your city to burn down a part of your city to fend off the invaders. Part of this might be just wrapping them up a little bit, or when they really depend on the local infrastructure of your city to spread. It might be a good idea to destroy the city and the surrounding farms and to rebuild later on. That's a very costly thing to do, right? Uh, so that's why I guess inflammation is so expensive to our body and actually reduces our lifetime because you have to uh, go through a bunch of your stem cells to rebuild later on, right? right. So uh, in, in this sense, it seems to me, to me that inflammation is maybe not a universal mechanism to explain cognition <coughs> or all these things, but it's a very specific response that happens only in extreme circumstances, or of course circumstances that we tend to, to look at a lot because basically you have this large fire going on in your body. Is this the right way to think about inflammation, or is there something else that I'm missing in this perspective? I mean, it's, I, think, I think it's a really good perspective on what the microbiome's role is in inflammation or inflammation of the microbiome. And that's, so you could teleologically argue that all we are is uh, a convenient vehicle that bacteria devised to have us carry them around from one food source to another and that some bacteria want to make sure that their competitor bacteria don't hang around so they use us. Hold on, to keep this them. is like saying that cattle have devised us as a convenient way to carry us around between different meadows, right? So mm -hmm. this is read, not, uh, I don't uh, think that's the right perspective. Of the galaxy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I don't so, think that's the right perspective. I think, I think it misses an important point, right? I mean, we no, are so no, no, I mean, I'm not even, I'm, all I'm saying is I'm saying that just to have a contrary point of view. Yeah. The actual real big fight is the self non self discrimination part of it. So it was a big fight in the early days of immunology, and then the advent of, of the concept of damps created a new fight. Uh, it was uh, people that said that damps are, or that the system is evolved to detect bacterial or other type of infection, versus the people that said the system is evolved to fix damage. Right. So which one came first? very hard to sort out because these systems are used for both. And so you can't just use evolution because they're, but they're basically used constantly. And on top of that, part of the research, which I didn't mention, part of the response to damage, which leads to inflammation, often leads to leakiness in 
gut, which then releases bacteria and secondary <coughs> inflammation due to that. So it's, the system is an integrated system. The determination of, of what came first and what was the teleological reason that the thing came together and which one is an epiphenomenon that evolved over time, you could argue it both ways. You know, did we first evolve to deal with our own damage and then as we became more multicellular and more compartmentalized and now we were colonized by bacteria, coincidentally they found us and made us into their, their cooler, um, then, then now that mechanism is used to deal with them, right? Or it wasn't the other way around, and well, as a coincidence, we happen to get the ability to also fix our damage. Or maybe none of the above, and it's really always been about um, you know, some, some level of, uh, of neural control that, or neural function that happens to be really important and all the other stuff just isn't happening. You know, I don't know. I mean, I don't think anybody ever will know, or at, at least at some level, nobody will know. Hopefully, people can be, untangle those possibilities. I think computational modeling may help, but we may come up with uh, ways where we can run our models uh, and see what kind of outcomes they predict and which one could co co right. carry out. I think that might be about the only thing. We have a question. Can you ask in Spanish? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> I came prepared. I, I, I picked my parents Perfect. before coming here. And then no, on the plane, you did this Babel, Babel yeah, app, no, no, right? You just did it on the plane. It was, it was a genetic thing. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. uh, dentro de la, para que el proceso de antiinflamación sea, o sea, una de sus, de sus propósitos es la regeneración. Usando terapia celular, por ejemplo, con células mesenquimales, que sí. mejora la, la, o sea, la cicatrización en este caso, que se ha visto con enfermedades. Entonces, viéndolo desde ese punto de vista, eh, también se podría usar para solo la antiinflamación, ¿no es cierto? O sea, para que ayude, para que mejore. Se están usando esas células mesenquimales eh, como terapias experimentales en sepsis y también en trauma. Entonces, por, por eso, por, por lo por, no es solo antiinflamatorio, está reprogramando la respuesta. Can you provide the subtitles as well for the English speaking <laughs> The question was about mesenchymal stem cells. So some of you may know. So mesenchymal stem cells are a particular kind of stem cell. They um, th they've been really implicated in uh, sort of reprogramming inflammation. Some people consider that anti-inflammation. I think that's actually again a simplistic term. It's a kind of reprogramming. Um, and so it turns out that you can use these to do regeneration. But you can also, <laughs> as, as I was saying, you can actually there are now um, it's a very hot area of investigation the use of mesenchymal stem cells to improve outcomes in sepsis and, and trauma. Um, I think that the story is actually way more complex than that because actually inflammation is part of the process by which even pluripotent stem cells and maybe totipotent stem cells become differentiated into what they are going to become. So again, inflammation matters for a lot more than just, I mean, I think the word inflammation someday should go out uh, and be replaced with some other word that implies a benefit because most of the time inflammation, of course, is considered a negative thing and that's right. a historical comment. But we use it, so you couldn't be born without inflammation. There's an inflammatory response to the process of parturition that has to be regulated and then the baby is born. So you can't develop without inflammation, you can't be born without inflammation, you can't, uh, you can't differentiate without inflammation. You cannot interact with the real world. Right? And that's why I said, I think to me that's why I believe that excluding that, of course, including many other things also in this world, but the idea that, that some, some of how you form your image of who you are, that some of that is driven by cues that are, we could call them inflammation, um, and that some of that is due to the fact that the brain so actively evolved and regulated inflammation, I think this is right. an intriguing high point. Yeah. Go for it. Uh, yeah, thanks for the talk, I'm really, really intriguing. Uh, so I guess one of the issues uh, in this, when you think about like this connection with, with the brain and with uh, possible to bring it up to a, other kind of like a high level cognition, um, um, impacts into the kind of a temporal scale of the changes that you observe. So at least in your data, you show that most of these things are kind of like trans, kind of like transforming or happening in moderation over hours, um, if not days. And well, that, that's a function of how we, how you measure the precision in which we can measure. Uh, we are trying to measure faster than in cell culture, animal, and you can see things faster. I was showing you more proud of the clinical data, and a lot of that is, you know, it's, it was pretty heroic to get the data at that level. Realize that the first few hours, 
after a patient with severe trauma gets admitted are incredibly hectic in a clinical care point of view. We asked our community mm -hmm. coordinators to get us three time points in the first 24 hours, an average across 500 patients since then, but actually we had about every four hours. So we also have a reasonable number of data points in the first couple of hours. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's not that. What I showed in the survivor versus non-survivor study shows a, dis, uh, a, dis, uh, you know, a bifurcation in the networks from as early as we can measure. Mm -hmm. We are doing some studies that are at the, at the transports or at the helicopter or the ambulance. It's easier to do those studies actually in Europe, because especially in Germany, where the doctors actually go to the scene. Mm -hmm. uh, in the US, it's emergency medical personnel that bring people to the hospital. And um, we, we have just, uh, now I wasn't on the study, but Jason Sperry from our group just um, published a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, on a, a therapeutic intervention for trauma that was done at the transport, and that required quite a big infrastructural uh, uptake get that to happen. So, but as they're doing that, we are going to be able to get data even more proximate to the time. So, um, in some sense, we can think about implement, the implementary response as an actuator. Yes. It, it's sort of, uh, it's the body acting at the level of organs or tissues, whatever, to react to a perturbation, right? And to yes. try to restore some, some it's an intermediate process about between the, 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 the initiating event and the outcome, but because of its nature, it can become the driver of the outcome. No, sure. Right. But, but now, let's now reason through the scenario that the brain tries to control that. Yes. Right? So that's the way that we control the skeletal muscle system. Mm -hmm. So the first question is, of, of course, then, okay, but what are the, what's the bandwidth I have to control the system, right, to send signals to the system? What's the bandwidth I have to reach states of that system? So, can you say something about that? What, what's in the bandwidth? Is it only the vagus? Do I only have the vagus with, let's say, either the, the motor pathway or the sensory pathway to, 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 to control, to drive signals into the inflammatory response? Or do I have, would I have other channels available to me? Yeah, so I mean, I think that's, so I think the, the first answer to the question is. The system seems to have a way to regulate itself in a way that looks not too different from the entire macro system down to the single inflammatory cell as well. So that certain behaviors, we, we were interested in the behavior of preconditioning. So give inflammatory stimulus, wait a little bit of time, give a second inflammatory stimulus, you know, different magnitudes. You can get all these outcomes like potentiation, or you can get attenuation, or we call it tolerance, or you can get that the second one is the same as the first one. Right, so we can, with mathematical models that are based at the whole animal level, we can see that, or we can do it at the level of a simple receptor activation model in macrophages, we can see that. Mm -hmm. and, and people can do that in culture. There's no, there's no nerves there, there's no brain, and yet some key features are clearly regulatable. At, so the system is, as I said, for lack of a better word, sort of fractal. The more you zoom in, the more you keep seeing the same basic abilities, mm -hmm. right? But there must be something extra, right? Either that something extra is there be, as a, necessary trade-off. So that if we needed a brain to do all lots of other stuff, and we still needed to have inflammation, we needed to have the brain as we got bigger, right. as we got more things happening in different places, you know, we had to have this layer of well, control. Well, Maybe that's what it is. But that right. also brings right. automatically this whole concept of allostatic control, right? Because yes. you could think about every organ as being some homeostatic regulated system right. that goes for a set point, but as soon as you bring them together, you have to, you can only find your stability and continuous change. <laughs> Across all these control groups, right? Right, so, right. so, but in your in your talk, I didn't really see this notion of allostasis really coming up, and that's really where I think you need the brain-like controller yeah. because then the complexity is such that the local regulators just cannot keep up. Cannot keep up, right? So, yeah. yeah. So I mean, I, mean, I, mean, I was hoping to try to get that across, but that's what I was trying. To yeah. Oh, but, but allostasis as a concept, I didn't really mention. You no. know, I thought in, in in the physiology of certain organ systems, it seems. Mm -hmm. really Rather, it's a central construct. I mean, did I misunderstand? Well, I mean, so I mean, obviously, allostasis is is an older concept that it still has a lot of validity. People are the era of, of, of gene arrays. People want to look at that rather than think about the, the physiology of how these things work. Um, that's an entire separate discussion. Mm -hmm. um, but but I think I, I think you know. As I said, I think you're totally right. I was trying to get kind of at that, uh, probably just without using those words. Okay. Um, because again, I find myself in places where people. Involved the way of saying the basic concept, which is right. Okay. I, I think, the, 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 right, I said at, at some level, 
you can get to this physiologic argument of, you know, did we evolve a brain to be, or some function in the brain to regulate inflammation because it was a necessary trade-off? Or did the brain develop some of its functions uh, as, as a consequence of, of living in an inflammatory environment? Uh, and did it now co-opt some of those functions to do things like memory, you know, the, you know memory, uh, fixing memories or changing right. the direction of memories or things like that? Which, as you know, we have many examples in biology where that happened. You know, we, we, we had to fight off bacteria for a while, then we got tired of fighting them off, and then we said, why don't you come live in us, and then now we have mitochondria, right. and then we did that, and we did all kinds of additional stuff. So at some level, it's probably a stochastic evolutionary process, you start to go, you start to go, I don't like it, I don't like it, then one individual happens to go, hey, I, right. can, I can use that. And then but in the evolutionary terms, does um, inflammation occur in any multicellular or a single cellular organism? If, if you look at things like the response to the dams, or certainly the response to my, microbial problems, I mean, uh, you know, bacteria will have responses to viruses, and okay. bacteria will have responses to other bacteria, and uh, so, no, I mean, Really, single cell organisms are constantly dealing with having to fight off other single cell organisms right. uh, or lower organisms, and then uh, they're being damaged mm -hmm. and stressed. And right. in fact, they have, they, they have much more, they're much more exposed to stressful agents because they don't have an outer skin and outer protective barriers that allow them to kind of keep some things at bay. Right. They, they are immediately dealing with them and they've moderated and so forth. So, at some level, if you consider that anything that you do in response to that, and you look at the mediators that are made, and they're homologous to inflammatory mediators, and you say inflammation is there always. Right, exactly. And that's what I said, even, to, even for Yosha's question, yeah. even at that level, you couldn't detangle whether you were first fighting off something infectious or first trying to fix your damage. Because I think you were dealing with both at the same time. Right. Yeah. All right, with those words, Joram, thank you very much.